Um, for those of you who are joining us maybe for the first time, we are concluding our study in the book of 2 Thessalonians. And so we spent four weeks. So you can go back online in our archive or through our app and just sort of start from the beginning if you wanted to. But we're finishing our study today with don't be idle. <clears throat> don't be idle. Something that Paul uh, specifically mentions as was a problem at that time and perhaps still a challenge uh, maybe in our time and what that idleness looks like and how we can continue to pursue Christ uh, with everything that we have. So let's pray together, and then we will jump right in, okay? Father, I thank you for another opportunity to look into your word, God. I thank you that we have it. I thank you that we can trust it, God. And I thank you that by your spirit, you can apply it to our hearts and in our lives in a most significant way, God. And so I pray that we would uh, just continue to move from head knowledge, God, to heart knowledge and to allow you by your spirit to, to challenge us, uh, to change us, to transform us. And I thank you for this letter, which is so applicable to even where we live and the things that we are confronted with. So bless our time in your word this morning, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. All right, so we are looking at don't be idle. So just as a quick review, we started with God's righteous judgment, um, and we talked about the fact that this church in Thessalonica, which is still, well, the area is still there. It's in Europe, Greece at the bottom, um, some of the European countries at the top, Rome in the west, Judaism had come in uh, from the east. And so it was a, a very interesting place that was, um, you know, a lot of money in there, but a lot of different cultural influences. And Paul, on his second missionary journey, he went to this church, he preached, people got saved, the church was established, and people were growing in their relationship with God. But at the same time, you can appreciate that with all of the different uh, warring cultures that were going on, Paul had to really teach them to cut through all of that, cut through even the things that they thought that they knew based on the culture that they had grown up in, to cling to God's Word. All right? And so Paul started off with, um, well, we started off, God's righteous judgment, just understanding that God has uh, their back, our backs, um, a lot of stuff going on. God will repay those who trouble his people. It's up to God. It's not for us to decide how we should get people back or anything like that. And then in week two, we looked at the lawless one. So looking at prophecy a little bit, uh, some specific things to keep in mind. This church, they were starter started to get a little rattled in their faith because some persons had basically been teaching them that, you know, they missed the rapture. They missed the rapture. That's what they were teaching them, that you were literally living in the day of the Lord, which would be Jesus' judgment poured out on the earth. But Paul had previously taught that whilst that will happen, the church will not be here. They will be raptured before those events. And so what the Thessalonians had to deal with was like, well, if we missed the rapture, Paul, like, are you truthful? Like, did God forget us? Did we not make the cut? They were going through all of this stuff. And so Paul describes specifically some of the events that would take place before the day of judgment so that the Lord, the, the, the day of the Lord, sorry, so that this church will know for sure that they hadn't missed God's timetable. They haven't missed God's grace. They're still part of the church. God didn't forget about them. Those events are still coming up. But the reason why that this was a major confusion in their minds was that the persecution that they were experiencing was intense. So they knew that the day of the Lord was a time when turmoil would be on the earth, and they were thinking that maybe it's what they were experiencing. But Paul reassures them, no, you're experiencing the fact that you are living for Jesus in a broken, ungodly world, and there is persecution that comes with that. So he clarifies these things. That's what we looked at at week two. And then week three, we took a break. We actually had our fun day, so that was kind of cool. Uh, and, but last week, we looked at Stand Firm. How is it that whilst we have all of these cultural clashes, we have all of these competing ideas that we can stand firm on the truth of God's Word? And so that's what we looked at last week. And so today we're looking at don't be idle. Don't be idle. So we're going to start with 
Verse 1, 2 Thessalonians 3, and there's a lot of verses. We're not going to cover all of them, but we will read through them. One thing I, I, I constantly want to teach and make sure persons grasp, Scripture out of context can go wrong. You have to read Scripture in context. You have to understand who said what. You have to understand who it was said to, and you have to understand what the persons that received it understood the letter to mean in the first place. It's crucial. I use this example over and over again. I grew up in Bay, right? So for many of us down that end, if I said, meet me out at Bay Dock, we're going to swim out to Bay Island, you would know what that means. But if I only use the example and say, you know what, let's just swim out to Bay. Let's go to Bay. But if you're coming from the West or somewhere else, let's just say, you might go on a map and look for the closest Bay to where you are, but you won't be where everyone else knew to be because the context wasn't right. And that has nothing to do with whether or not I lie to you. Context matters. So when you're reading Scripture, you have to read it in context, okay? Proverbs, maybe that's a different book. That's a wisdom book. It's nuggets. You just grab them and suck them in. But when you look at these letters, you got to read them in context. I just, I'm sorry to sit there, but I've been hearing too much foolishness as of late. Like people grabbing stuff, and it's this, and it, it don't, if, if, if it didn't, it doesn't mean something new to you and I that's different from who it was intended to in the first place. So you can't grab something and say, well, this is what it means to fit it in right here, right now in my context. No, it only means what the author intended it to mean to the people who got it. Once we understand that, then we apply it to where we are based on how we fit into that context. You understand that? Is important. Sorry, that's my little rail for this morning. Here we go. Paul says this, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have a right, that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Also for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with them, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, though, but warn him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And that ends that book. I find it really interesting how Paul ends that. He says, listen, this is how I write. I'm really writing this. And I think it's a specific uh, reference to the fact that earlier in the book, it seemed as if some other letters came from Paul, but they didn't. They were false letters. So Paul's ending this book and is saying, listen, I don't want to have to raise this again. This is my handwriting. This is me speaking. Don't be confused by what some other people said to you previously that got you all rattled. All right? So just interesting. So starting in verse 1 and 2, Paul says, Finally, brothers, brothers and sisters, congregation members, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. Paul is ending his letter, and he's asking for prayer. He's asking for prayer. And he's praying something very specific, that the word of God, now that I'm not with you, missionary journey is finished, 
And I'm continuing to preach, but I want you to pray that God's word will continue to be effective just like it was when I came and preached to you. And, and what I love about this is the fact that Paul's saying, I don't want you to just pray from a theologically accurate space. That's true. We need to do that. But he's encouraging them to pray from an experiential place. So he's saying to them, listen, the only reason that all of you have been captured out of these cultures that you all grew up in and you believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's a supernatural work that took place, but literally this is what God did and this is why you all are even there naming the name of Jesus Christ. So what I'm asking you to do is pray that God's word would have the same impact as I continue to preach as it has had in your circumstances. Now, I find that instructive, at least for me, because sometimes I might have the tendency to pray theologically and accurately, and that's important, that's important, don't get me wrong. But what God would oftentimes want us to do is live out of the experiences, the experiences that we've had theologically with God. In other words, this church, they would have been able to know what it was like as Paul is preaching in another place with a lot of other cultural issues going on, to know what it was like to be rattled on the inside, to want to trust God, to know that family might come against you and all of that stuff. And Paul is asking them to pray from that place. Pray based on the fact that you already know because it's happened among you. I think about that for ourselves. Sometimes I think the experiences that we have, we need to hold them sometimes even the most painful ones, because it gives us a window and a spiritual insight into what somebody else may be experiencing, and we can pray from that space. It's just different. Now, that's not to say we're all going to have the same experiences, and my experiences is better than yours. Or what. I don't know. But all I do know is that the experiences that we do have with God, they're genuine experiences. And so when we come alongside other people, we, don't ought, we ought not just pray, quote, unquote, the right prayers, but we pray from an experiential space that says, you know what, I know this is where you are, but I know what God can do because he did it in my life. And that's how we need to pray, and that's what Paul was asking this church to do. The other thing I find instructive about this, again, this is a very young church. The believers here are definitely under five years of, of following Christ, maybe less than that. But regardless of how uh, new they are in their faith, Paul is still entrusting them with this big prayer. You might never see me again is sort of implied in here. Again, this isn't video chat days. This is just a letter. Paul ain't seeing these people again. They're probably not seeing him again. But he's entrusting the fact that he needs for them to pray in a specific way from a specific experience because he's going to continue to go preaching the gospel. So for you and I, as we have experiences, difficult experiences, experiences that God has allowed us to have for one reason or another, hold those dear and when we pray for persons, allow God to help us to pray from those spaces. It matters. Sometimes if there's a healing that we are praying for, and we might have a congregational prayer here or what have you, sometimes it might be that I would ask somebody who I know has been through cancer to pray for this person who is now struggling with it. Because as the theologically correct as I can pray, and God gives us all wisdom to pray, but I haven't experienced that. And so it, it's, it's just different, not better, just different, and it's something that uh, we need to keep in mind. Paul goes on in verse 2 and he says, and that we may deliv be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. So he's praying, pray for us. He's asking for prayer, pray for us. We're going to continue to preach. We want God's word to be as effective wherever we go as it has been where you all are. You know what it means to come out of where you came from to believe in Christ. I want you to pray from that space. But I also want you to pray that we would be protected and delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. I guess we know that, right? You live life a little bit, and you find out not that we're perfect, but you find out that there are some specific persons and some specific plots that are against you and I because we name the name of Jesus. And that's just how it is. Not everyone has faith. Even persons that sometimes can talk Bible don't have faith. It's just the way that it is. So Paul is saying, listen, this is what's going to be going on. This is what I need you to pray for. And then he says in verse 3, whilst all of that stuff is true, 
you might meet some people that don't have no faith, but the Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful. Again, this has to be seen in the larger context. From the beginning, this church, they're rocked, right? Paul's trying to sort out some stuff. Some of them are ready to give up on this thing. If we had time to study 1 Thessalonians into 2 Thessalonians, you'll see this consistent theme, which is, um, well, if this is it, why do I have to work? I could just hang out. Like, you know, people are persecuting me. Like, am I supposed to do anything? Is this the only thing that I can expect? And so then we run into 2 Thessalonians, and Paul is again addressing that, and he's just like, listen, the issues that you have, they may not go away. We talked about this last week. But the Lord is faithful. You might find some unfaithful people. There are people who are literally trying to get you out of the game in the worst places, sometimes it's in business, could be friends, it could be a whole lot of stuff. But the Lord's faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And then in verse 6, just going to go right to it. He says, now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. What tradition is that? Paul says it, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. Again, I think it's very instructive to appreciate what Paul is telling them and how we can apply it to ourselves. This is the Apostle Paul. As he traveled around, there were certain rights that he has. In Corinthians, he addresses it in terms of what? Am I the only one who is not supposed to have a wife? And he goes on and he just describes his heart a little bit. Because sometimes persons were harsh towards Paul and the things that he did and who do you think you are. But there are some rights that Paul had access to and could have claimed. And so he's saying, it's not because as an apostle, as a worker, I had not the right to receive from you if you wanted to give me a love gift or if you wanted to give me a salary and all that. All of those things were right for me to do. But they, wouldn't have, they would not have benefited you all in the way that you needed to be. And I think this is very instructive for us because there are many rights that we have as people I'm not suggesting that we ought to be doormats. I'm not suggesting that at all. But there are some times that there are rights that you and I know, like we're right, this person was wrong. We know that. But the question is, do we claim that right and make everyone bow to the fact that that's my right? Or by the grace of God, based on the circumstance, do I allow not taking that right so that I can see people grow up in their faith in Jesus? It's a constant question when you look through the scriptures and you appreciate, appreciate Paul's life. Like, he had a right to these things. Elsewhere, he teaches in terms of getting a salary as a pastor or a bishop and all the rest of it. But he recognizes that, you know what? There are times that me demanding my right is not going to be good for you. We're all going to have situations like that. I think one of the most challenging, I think, for me is as a parent, right? Um, there are some things that, quote, unquote, I have rights to, you know, like you pay most of the bills, if not all of the bills and things like that. I'm not being facetious. But there are times where one has to determine how before God am I going to use this experience and my life to benefit other people. And so Paul says this, listen, I have the right to not work as hard as I have. Not that I'm lazy, but I have the right. But I decided, you know what, that wouldn't be good for you. And so he says, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Pretty, pretty direct. I don't think there's any way else to see those words. If you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Let me say that again. If you don't work, you shouldn't eat. That's what Paul says. He's talking to this community. And what, what was really interesting, we'll get to this in a little bit, is what that idleness and busy bodiness meant to these people and why Paul had to cut through it. So in verse 11, he says this, for we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies, but busy bodies. Now, 
in the Greco-Roman times, some of the aristocratic level, they despised work, right? Their whole mindset was to be successful, to know that you've arrived as you have slaves, you don't work. So it's possible that some of them were clinging to that, wanting to sort of elevate themselves out of the difficult circumstances that they were feeling and experiencing. But that's just how some of the culture was at the time. Another philosophy that was rampant at the time was the cynic because cynicism, cynic um, 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 philosophy. And it was the idea that we need to totally abandon from all material stuff absolutely completely. So what these persons would do as a religious practice would be to go around begging for money as if that was holier than actually working for it. So they would go around and just say, give me, give me, give me. After all, I'm protecting my mind and my heart because I'm this important and I need to do this. So I don't have time to work and do this stuff. So I just go around begging for money. So this seems to be this ideas that some in that culture adopted. That's where they lived. That's where they grew. Grew up. Interesting for us, you always have to question the cultural norms that you and I sort of allow to govern us. They may be true. They may be not. But just because they are doesn't mean that's the things that we follow. And so what many were trying to do at this time, this idleness, it was really interesting. Many of them abandoned this whole work ethic and decided to be traveling philosophers. And they would go and meet at different places just to talk about stuff. And this was the major Greek influence that had permeated in that place. And so they had abandoned work. They had abandoned their families. They're like, well, where are you going today? I'm not sure. Well, what do you mean I'm not sure? Well, I know that they're discussing this way down. They're discussing who's going to win cup match down at this place. So I'm going to spend the next week just hanging out there. And while I go, I'm going to be begging for stuff. But this was a practice. This is just what happened. This is how some of these persons thought. And so that's the idleness that Paul seems to be addressing based on the cultural context. So they weren't busy at work, and these are able-bodied people. These are people that God gave health and strength to, a mind and a heart to honor him, but they have come to the conclusion that doing it society's way seemed to elevate themselves over and above just honoring God with what God gave them. And so that's what was happening. And then the busy bodies was, again, as you can imagine, getting into everybody else's business instead of dealing with their own stuff. So you don't want to work. You want family to support you. You don't want to use your good, able body to honor God and contribute to other people because it's not just about working and making money for yourself, but as a contributor, you can't contribute if you're not getting yourself involved in stuff. And so they would do these month-long circuits to talk about philosophy and stuff. And this is the space in which Paul is trying to cut through all of that with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a work ethic that we find in the gospel. It's not just a question of, well, I'm saved, I'm just going to hang out and everybody takes care of me. It just doesn't work like that. And Paul had to teach them this whole thing. And he says also that, you know, I want you to work quietly and to earn your own living. The idea of quietly is, listen, when you stop all that traveling nonsense and settle down and appreciate the health that God's given you and the ability to contribute, when you do find something, don't make it about, you don't have to go and ring all the bells and say, hey, you all, look, I'm working here. Okay. No, just, just go about your business. Just be methodical is what Paul is telling this church. I think for us sometimes, we have to really evaluate what that idleness might look like in our lives and what the busy bodies may look like. One of the things that I've had to come to grips with, and I'm understanding this more and more, I think the idea of busy bodiness is very easy to move to the next step of judgment and judging other people. And the reason is when we're busy identifying everything that's wrong in everybody else's life, Guess whose lives we're not evaluating? That's been my experience. And that's not to say that we ought not be honest about what we see. Because if something's wrong, it's wrong. 
But we have a tendency to find and see everything that's wrong in everybody else instead of taking as much time, if not more, I would argue, to figure out what's going on inside of ourselves and what God wants us to do. So this whole busy body, it's, 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 it's horrible. It's detrimental. You can see all of the stuff, but like, you should have been doing that. And you should, well, yeah, okay, that's maybe true, but, you know, what about you? You know, what, what are you working on? What is God teaching you? So we've got to live those quiet lives. As we get ready to end, and we're going to answer some questions in a little bit, so this is what Paul says. As for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. I reckon the only reason that Paul is writing this is for a lot of reasons. As again, we go through the book. One, they're tired of persecution. Tired of persecution. They're tired of being ostracized. They're tired of being blamed for everything that's wrong in the culture. Uh, they're tired of not even being able to come home and have a quiet dinner with family because family doesn't like them. They're, they're tired of having to find new work every other week or every other month because as soon as the boss finds out that they're a Christian and they're a follower of Jesus, you got to go. They're tired of holding up a standard which they're learning as a new church, but nobody else seems like they're following it. They're tired. They're tired. They're tired of looking around and seeing people who profess to be followers of Christ not following Christ. So my question is, do you ever feel like that? Paul's instructions to this church this fledgling church is don't grow weary in doing good. And I think by implication, Paul is suggesting that it's very easy to become weary in continuing to follow Christ because it's not easy. It's just not easy. At the opportunity yesterday, I was at a um, birthday function, some guys getting together, playing tennis, and just rapping, hanging out and stuff. And uh, many of us are fathers. Right, and we're just talking about the climate of, of life, you know, in the U.S. and here and all the rest of it. And as difficult as it can be sometimes to figure out what is biblical Christianity, based on what others claim it to be, it's easy if you read the Bible, but based on what many say, it can be confusing sometimes. And then we came to the realization, an obvious one, that you know what, not only is it chaotic, but this is the world in which we have to raise our children in. It is it's, it's nuts out there. And if you're waiting for the right premier, or if you're waiting for the right president, or if you're waiting for the right this person or that person, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be optimistic. God raises up people. God takes away people. And God can use people however he wants. But God's grace and God's biblical standards, they ought to be lived out by his church, his representatives. And in that, as we look to Christ, we find our plumb line. Not, not, not from a president. Not the, they have their places. They have their places. But as you look around and you see what you see, you don't have to make excuses and give people a pass. No, foolishness is foolishness. Heresy is heresy. Uh, evil is evil. Wickedness is, you just call it for what it is. But at times, it can be very tiring. It can be very tiring. I, I, I go through that as a pastor. I wouldn't say I go through it more than anybody else. I just have a different role. This is what God's called me to. I take it seriously, and, you know, that's what it is. But there are times where it's just like, God. I'm tired. Like, is, is tomorrow, is a day like today the only thing that I can look forward to tomorrow? Right? Right now, it's a very difficult season with some of the tragedies that we've had and, and just, you know, God's trying to impress upon me how it is I come alongside people. So some tough visits this week, tough conversations and the like. And it, it gets tiring. No, that's just me. But remember, I'm not asking you to think it through from my filter. Paul is addressing a church who had lots of different experiences, lots of different challenges, and he's saying, God, I, I, I know you're probably getting tired because it's not easy. But do not grow weary. Don't grow weary. 
Don't grow weary. That's the time to dig in. That's the time to sit in the grace of God. That's the time to stand firm in his word. That's the time to continue to live out the life that Christ has called us to be. I know it's tiring. I know it's tiring. Relationally, sometimes in our relationships, our marriages, they aren't what we want. They aren't where we want them to be. And it's tiring. I'm not blaming anybody, right? It's tiring. Right. There's a loss that just happened, and on top of that, my marriage isn't going the way that I need it to, and what it's tiring. And I guess I'm emphasizing this because I want you to know what I'm understanding more and more. God knows that. God used Paul to write this, and Paul is being very realistic, and he's saying, with everything that you go through, I'm still encouraging you not to grow weary. Don't give up. Don't grow weary. I know some of you are holding on for the miracle of healing. We keep praying with you through that. Some of us are praying through the miracle of, of children coming back to the Lord or, or this situation or that situation. Some of it's work. Some of it's, you know your stories. It's tiring. It's tiring. Paul understood that. Paul understood that. God understands that. But the instruction is you got to keep digging in. You got to keep digging in. Don't get weary in doing good. Now, if you get tired doing a whole lot of foolishness, that's on you. That's on me, right? Paul is being very specific. Peter echoes the same sentiment. You know, don't, 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 don't suffer persecution for evil and stuff that you're doing and then say, oh, everyone's against me. No, that's just because you're behaving badly. Do not grow weary in doing good. So, first question, do you get weary of doing good? Do you get weary in doing good? Yeah, gets, gets tiring sometimes. But if any of you have, you know, stuck to a workout program or anything like that, um, you know that it is difficult. But because it's difficult isn't the measure by which you use to say it's not working or I'm just going to give up. No, it's just difficult. Still worth it. Still worthwhile. Still the right thing to do. Do you get weary of doing good? Reminds me of even the times when Jesus was walking around when he was on earth. The Bible talks about the fact that Jesus, you know, he's taking a nap in the boat and it's a storm. And there were times when Jesus had to get out. He had to rest. He had to rest in his humanity ministry was hard. You see the stress that it took on him and on the disciples sometimes, right? They got excited with, oh, let's keep going. Jesus said, no, 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 you guys need a break. Let's, let's, it's hard. It can be very wearisome, all right? Second question is this, are you an idol follower of Christ? Probing question, only you can answer that for yourself. Um, I think as we think about this whole thing of idleness, are we more inclined to make sure other people know that we think like they think and we're in the think tank of ideas and all the rest of it as opposed to a specific and intentional follower of Christ? Because as we do that, I would argue that we would be forfeiting emotional space in which our minds and hearts can be dedicated to God, but it's now being occupied by a whole lot of other stuff which may not be as beneficial. What does idleness look like for you and me? It's going to look different for each and every one of us. You know, what does that look like, being an idol follower of Christ? And maybe it starts here. You mean you can actually be a follower of Christ and be idle? Apparently. That's what Paul said. And you trace that all through his letters. It's just being honest. It's like you may think you're following Christ. You may be a genuine follower in Christ in terms of your redemption and the application of the Holy Spirit of God to your life. Can you still be idle? Yeah. Can you still be wrapped up in all of the, the business of the day? Yeah. Can you still be a, a busy body getting involved in everybody else's life and all of the other things and neglecting the things that God wants to challenge you with? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the implication. That's what Paul is talking about there. Another question. Are you trying to live off of someone else's relationship with Christ? That could be what idleness looks like. Right? It could be that God is really challenging me to do this. And I'm going to take half a step towards that, but I'm going to rest in the fact that, you know what, I go to this church or my 
auntie is praying for me. And, I, and praise God for all of those things. But you and I, we cannot live off anybody else's spirituality. You, you just can't. It may be a good stepping stone. That's what God has designed this church to be a space in which we encourage each other to grow. But at the end of the day, you are responsible for your relationship with God. I'm responsible for my relationship with God. Together, we hold each other accountable for being responsible for our own relationship with God. That's just how it works. And so I want to encourage us all, like, don't become idle in the fact that, you know what? Don't you know my family name? We've been churchgoers from... Well, you thank God for that, and then you develop your own relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't you remember, like, I graduated from this school or this theological discipline or whatever. Great. Praise God for that. But are you developing your relationship with Christ? Because at the end of the day, only you can do that. I can teach. I can preach. Hopefully, the way that I live my life backs up what I teach. That's very important. But at the end of the day, I can't make you grow. I can't. Going through one of the parables, I'll probably teach on this at some point, but it just, Jesus is making the point that the sower sows, and you know what else he does? He goes to bed and wakes up. He goes to bed again and wakes up. He don't know how it works. The best of scientists, all they can tell you is what happens, but they don't know how it works. God does that. But if the seed isn't sown and the soil isn't receptive to it, guess what? you're not going to see the fruit that otherwise might be. And that's something that you have to take responsibility for, you, and I do. And I know for me, growing up, Christian home, pastor, my dad, and I praise God for that upbringing, I, I lived on that. I lived on the fact that I'm safe because I go to church. Only to find out once I got outside of church, everything went crazy, and I lived in the world for a lot of years, right? But all that to say, earn your relationship with Christ. Grow it. Don't live in anybody else's relationship. Young people, uh, develop a personal relationship with God early for yourself and grow. And grow. Take the encouragement from adults. And I'm going to be honest, this is going to be very probing. If your adults are not following what the Bible is saying, you don't stop honoring them, but you stop allowing them the biblical authority in your life because you are serious about growing your relationship with Christ. I don't know how else to say that. That's for me. If I go off, go somewhere else. Okay? This is important. We have to grow our own relationship. Can't live off of anyone else's relationship with Christ. Another question when it comes to tiredness and weariness. Do you get discouraged by the idleness you see in others? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. You ever think about that sometimes? Sometimes we might come to the conclusion like it's the Elijah syndrome. I'm the only one left. It's discouraging. No, Elijah was wrong in that instance, but he was true in terms of feeling like that. That's how we felt. But God had to remind him, no, you're not the only one. And so whilst you and I may be, be able to identify persons who are saying that they're following Christ, maybe a little bit more immature than us, maybe growing We've got to have a lot of grace in there. Just remember where God's taken us from. Again, it's not a question of just uh, suggesting, oh, it's no big deal, or that's not really what's going on. No, it is what it is. But with that, the grace that says, you know what? God's the one, just as God's the only one that can cause that little plant to grow, he's the only one who can change what's going on in their lives, and I'm just going to keep living for God with all that I have. So my encouragement is not to put your head in a hole or in the sand, but at the same time, have grace. Have grace. You're going to see some things in church. You're going to see some things in your families. You're going to see some things. And it will discourage you. Paul got discouraged. You know, he'd be preaching and some guys just say, you know what, Paul? Check you later. So, like, Paul, what happened? It's discouraging, right? People saying one thing and doing something else. It's very discouraging. But with that, this is what. God will want us to remember. God is faithful. The Lord is faithful. And I really want to encourage you to let God grow you first and foremost before you want to see somebody else grow. 
I think sometimes, especially as a parent, and we've done some parenting classes before and teaching and stuff, and I think one of the things as parents, this is just an example, but we oftentimes want better for our kids than we'd want for ourselves. And I get that. I get that. But spiritually speaking, the good is wrong. Because if we only want our kids to be more spiritually mature than us, how are they going to come alongside and see what it looks like to be mature? It's a balance. We're all in a growing. But sometimes we desire that our children be the straight arrows, but we're not intending to let God straighten us out. It's just true. That's been my experience. So with everything that we go through, the persecution, the heartache, the doctor results, the diagnosis, the things that will happen this week, next week, not speaking anything over anybody, so I don't want you to hear that. I'm just talking life. The Lord is faithful. You're going to meet some people that aren't faithful. You're going to meet some people that say, well, I'm a Christian. Okay, I'm not God. I'll leave that up to him. But I'm, I'm seeing some gaps. And it's discouraging. It's, I'm not sure. But God's faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Let's close our eyes for a second and <sighs> Jesus. You may be here this morning and there's a specific challenge that you're facing. Specific thing, unique, right? And maybe you've come to the conclusion that you're the only one who is facing it. And so therefore, nobody else could know what it feels like to go through what I'm going through. And maybe the thing that you're going through literally has you in this shaky space in your faith which says, well, I've been traveling with God long enough. I don't know where else to go but I'm still trusting God for different. Like, that's the conclusion that Jesus, when he asked Peter, Peter, you want to leave too? All the crowds were leaving. Peter's like, well, well, where else are we supposed to go? You have the words of eternal life. Now, Peter wasn't saying that from a comfortable space. He was just saying, I've walked with you long enough, Jesus. This is uncomfortable, but like, where else am I supposed to go? And all of those things can contribute to heaviness and weariness, tiredness in the spiritual experience. And it's at those moments, following what the apostle Paul said, said, listen, don't get tired. Don't grow weary in doing good. Don't grow weary in doing good. I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult even, if I'm honest, just to follow through with some financial commitments that we've made at times. I know and that's between you and God. I'm not trying to get all up in there. But I know what that's like. I know what it's like to continue to pray for a family member. And you don't necessarily see the thing that you're praying for. But always remember that God's at work. But the experience that you and I live in, in this broken world, is that there will be some wearisome times. There just will be. And Paul's instruction, Paul's encouragement to this church is that you got to hold on. you got to let God's grace overwhelm you. And you got to keep living for Jesus. So do you get where you're doing good? Yeah, I think we can all appreciate that that is part of our experience. Are you an idol follower of Christ? Are you trying to live off of someone else's relationship with Christ? And do you get discouraged by the idleness you see in others? Amen. I'm going to be quiet for maybe a minute or so, and then I am going to ask if you would like prayer of anything as registered with you. You can stand, and uh, we'll pray together. But right now, just quiet time from your heart to daddy's heart, and then we'll finish up.
And I want to invite you, if any of these questions or anything that we've been talking about, maybe you're in a, a season that you are weary, just, just weary. Uh, why don't you just stand? We're just going to pray. I'm standing with you. Um, but if that's you, whatever it is, I, I'm, I'm tired. Not that you're ready to give up on your faith. But I'm tired. Like this, I'm waiting for this to change, God. I'm hoping that it'll change in the time frame that I am presenting. But even if it doesn't, God, I, I want to keep trusting you. I'm going to keep depending on you. If that's you, why don't, why don't you stand this morning? Getting a little weary. God knows what that's like. Paul knew what it was like. This church knew what it was like. Right? Maybe you are getting weary of trying to share the gospel with family members, and it comes back in a very uh, difficult and, and disrespectful way. Don't grow weary in doing good. So if that's you, just stand. I'm going to pray, and then we will uh, be out of here. Let's lift our hands to God this morning. Can we do that? Hallelujah, Jesus. We bless you, God. Father, I thank you and I bless you, God, that in all things we can come to you and find that your grace is available and that your grace is sufficient, God. Father, I thank you for your word, God, and I thank you for just how practical it is, Father God, and how plain, I suppose, in some ways it is, God. We don't have to interpret a whole lot of stuff, God. Paul's just speaking into a culture that persons had become weary of, 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 of following you, Jesus, and, and the persecution that came with that, and the heartache that came with that, and the conversations that continue to bombard their minds and some of the lies that others were telling them about who you were and, and all of the things, God, they became tired. Didn't mean that they were giving up on their faith, but became tired nonetheless, God. Father, I pray that you would help us, God, to continue to trust you, Father, especially when we can't trace you, especially when the thing that we're praying for doesn't seem to be turning around in the time frame that we ask for it, God. Help us to continually allow you to have access to us so that whilst we wait, we're still growing, God. Father, for everyone who is standing, God, you know the circumstance, you know the situation, God, you know what it is that they are praying for, you know what it is that they desire, God, but you also, as God, know what you are accomplishing. And so, Father, I pray that you would give a fresh measure of faith that you would give a fresh measure of grace, God, that you would give us hearts to receive what it is that you would have for us so that we can still navigate this life trusting in you, digging in our hands, God, or digging in our heels and saying, I will not let go of you, God. So, Father, I bless you, God, that even as I pray, God, I'm not bringing anything new to you, God. You know every circumstance, God. You know every situation, God. And you know what you are doing in response. So, Father, I'm praying as the Apostle Paul had to learn. As he prayed three times, will you take away this thorn in the flesh? And Jesus, you responded to him, not to say that, Paul, I don't care. Not to say, Paul, well, just grow up and get over it. Nope. You said, my grace is sufficient for you. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to have hearts of expectancy that when we call on you, we will find you. And when we ask for your grace, you will give it to us. And you will give us what we need to live the life that you have called us to live. Help us, God, to not grow weary in doing good. Help us, God, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. All right, well, that concludes our series and our sermon for today. Um, just want to ensure that you know that we are available to you for additional conversations or anything that may be helpful to you. We will make ourselves available. But um, God bless you. It's wonderful to see you. And um, next Sunday, Cop Mesh Sunday. All right. God bless you. We'll see you all soon, okay?